Well, welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Sarah Horton Deutsch and I am the director of the Watson Caring Science Center and this is our fourth and final webinar of the year. Today's webinar is exploring the evolution of Caritas literacy with a postmodern critique. And I am just so honored and blessed to have Dr. Jean Watson with us, the Dean Emeritus and um, Distinguished Professor Emeriti and founder of the Human Caring Science Center at CU. And um, Jean hardly needs an introduction. We all <laughs> know her very well. And before we get started, we also have Dr. Jan Anderson, who's um, off-site in uh, Santa Barbara. Jan's going to be um, fielding questions. If We're going to talk and dialogue for about 20 minutes, and then we will um, entertain questions. So if you have questions, you can send them to Jan in the chat. Please send the questions not in the Q&A, but in the chat to Jan, and she will read them and help facilitate a dialogue with us. So without further ado, Jan, welcome. Thank you, Sarah, and hi, Jean. It's great hi, to see you here. both. Delighted to be here. Well, Jean, I'm so excited to talk to you today about caring literacy. Because it's something that we've been dia dialoguing a lot about in the last year and something that we've been working with with our Caritas coaches for right. many years. Exactly. So in the new book that came out this last month on caring um, care test literacy, you um, put a quote that says, the notion of having fluency in caring at both personal and professional levels introduces a new meaning to deepen our ways of attending to and cultivating how to be deeply human, humane, and how to be caring and have a healing presence. Can you tell me more about what caring literacy means to you and being fluent? Yes, well, thank you, Sarah. I'm delighted to be here with you as well. And, um, you know, the discipline really needs to inform the profession and the evolution of the profession. And when we go back and attend to the ontology of being and what does it mean to be human and ask new questions about caring and healing and health from an ontological perspective, as well as an ethical perspective, it brought to my evolution, you know, the whole, first of all, acknowledging we have paid so much attention to technological competencies, but that's without being informed by the discipline and the philosophical, ethical, ontological foundation of the discipline. Mm -hmm. But if you go back and uncover the deep meaning of our heritage and our ancestors and the traditions and the values that inform the discipline and bring the theories and the uh, praxis together, it invited a new thinking for me to really say, okay, with all this approach to technological competencies, now we have to pay as much attention to ontological competencies. What does it mean to be? What does it mean to be human? And from that then, with this book, I started um, exploring, and even before this book, in my 2008 book, uh, Nursing the Philosophy and Science of Caring, which I think most people kind of know about by now, and it's been around a while, or this one, I don't know if you can see it. But on page 22, I start this whole exploration for myself mm -hmm. to raise questions like it was a work in progress, to ask new questions like, what would Caritas literacy look like? And so, you know, we came up with this, the caring, cultivating the caring consciousness and this intentionality as a starting point, the ability to center, to quiet down, to empty out, to read the field, to be present to be able to be with another. It's just the whole series of, of competencies and that can be explored more systematically through the 10 Kirtas processes as forms of evidence of competencies and forms of literacy. But more interestingly to me, in writing this chapter, I started in a postmodern critique, I started raising new questions about the whole concept of literacy. And we have thought about literacy in the terms of reading and writing, and arithmetic and so forth. But one of the um, dimensions or the uncovering of this that I discovered for myself, really, was what is the opposite of caring literacy? We have illiteracy. And then what would be forms of illiteracy that we can actually see? We, we have to pay attention to this because we have a responsibility to help sustain humanity and human dignity and the, our human dimensions of our, of our being and sustain caring in our systems and in society. So I'm wanting to point out that one of the things that highlighted this 
was this uh, work that was done by Susan Rosenberg. And it emerged out of a project at uh, Resurrection Health in Chicago, where she heard me speak and say, what we're doing when we're practicing caring, what we're really doing underneath those actions is we're preserving human dignity. We're We're preserving humanity. We're preserving integrity and wholeness of the person. And so what she did was develop this uh, protocol of compromised human dignity. But I want to use it just as a framework to show you forms of evidence of caring illiteracy, Mm -hmm. that we need to pay attention to this so that we can correct this. So forms of of illiteracy, once you start having a, a consciousness of compromised human dignity, we can find all these risk factors of caring competencies and caring literacy, which can be framed as illiteracy. And that's where the nurse or the health practitioner is exposing the human body, making the person vulnerable, intrusion by clinicians, perceived invasion of privacy, inadequate participation in decision-making, disclosure of confidential information, loss of control of body functions, use of undefined medical terms, perceived dehumanizing treatment, perceived humiliation, and stigmatizing labels. Those are only examples that have come from this one project on the NAND, the classification of compromised human dignity. But at another point, I would raise questions now about rather than looking for the negative of compromised human dignity, we need to start looking at ontological literacy of how do we preserve human dignity. But at the same time, when I did this last work, and then I'm going to be quiet, (laughs) is that I started also on my own coming up with evidence of Kertos illiteracy. And this, these are examples in the chapter. Inhumane, task conscious practices rather than human caring conscious Mm -hmm. practices. Use of a lower vibration objectifying language to objectify their humanity, scientizing of human emotions, their expressions, repressive and sensitive, dehumanizing, dividing, separating actions and policies. Our systems have crafted a commodification of caring in people. Other forms of illiteracy are harsh, unkind, controlling cultures within impersonal institutions and corporations and social networks. For example, Caritas illiteracy discriminates and uses distancing, depersonalizing languages, sometimes even abusive derogatory terms to reference the other who is different. There is evidence of hard-edged words and language which separates, labels, diagnoses, divides, and conquers inciting fear and distrust as a mean of control over others. So all of this is part of evidence of Caritas illiteracy. So I don't want to get too dramatic, but it's quite uh, dramatic. Once you start unraveling this and showing and revealing this, that we have a responsibility to attend to this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's a beautiful overview of um and I, I think what I love about the language of Caritas literacy is it, is it raises our consciousness to a higher level just in the use of using the language of literacy over competency. Exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. Competency still keeps us in that technical model. Mm-hmm. And we have responsibility. We're still in these um, industrial model thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know Jim, I talk, I talk about this all the time about how we're still in this industrial product line where our hospitals and our institutions, when we're in a digital, we're in a quantum world now. And now we have to pay attention that our whole caring consciousness is transcending that time and space and affecting the whole field. Mm-hmm. Or our non caring, this distancing inhumane language, how we treat another person, how we treat ourselves, mm-hmm. is really affecting the whole field of our work. Mm-hmm. So all of this is coming to another place for us to what I refer to as a critical uh, critique of our systems Mm -hmm. in our society. And it gets into social justice and all kinds of reflective practice and other dimensions that are so prevalent right now at this time. One of the things I love that you talk about in um, the introduction of this book is um, most of us or many of us have w- read Pablo Ferro's yes, book, The right. Pedagogy of the Press, and you talk about um, 
uh, Caritas literacy and relationship to critical literacy, which is something he's talked about for a very long time. And he says that um, the goal is in not just engaging in books and written tests, but also through reading that includes interpreting, reflecting, yeah, exactly. interrogating, theorizing, investigating, exploring, probing, and questioning, and writing that is acting on and dialogically transforming the world. Exactly. Isn't that beautiful? It is beautiful. And I think that kind of writing and that kind of lifting up mm-hmm. these questions and the whole concept of critical literacy, of being critically, how do we even ask new questions about what counts as knowledge, Mm -hmm. what counts as evidence. You know, these are questions of critical caritas literacy that as professionals, and if we are going to be really advancing a model of caring science, this is part of our ethical, ontological, Mm -hmm. philosophical values, theoretical foundation to advance the profession of nursing. We may not exist in the future. Mm -hmm. This is a very serious critical turning point. And I don't want to get too dramatic, but I do get dramatic because <laughs> it's, you know, I've heard very prominent leaders at the American Academy of Nursing say it is a matter of life or death for this profession. Mm-hmm. We either have to restore this and come give voice and language and inform moral action mm-hmm. and accountability for why are we even existing? Mm-hmm. And so by going in depth under the disciplinary foundation, critiquing and bringing forth these theories and models of caring and healing and health and wholeness are all part of the evolution of nursing at this time. And it's a beautiful, exciting turning point for us. Mm -hmm. It is. As an example, I had one of the Caritas um, colleagues call me this week and told me that she wanted to just process of she was going to have to have a very difficult conversation with someone who reported to her and she's new to caring science and wanted to make sure that she had this conversation and right relationship with the work of caring science and asked if I would process with her and it was it was such an honor and so we talked a little bit about the conversation that she had to have and she even though she was this person's manager she she wanted to come at it from a non-hierarchical exactly. way and have a different type of conversation. Yes, right. So we explored how yeah. she might do that, that she might introduce what they needed to talk about and then just listen exactly. and um, listen to this person's perspective. And then at the end, she said, you know, I think I'm just going to listen and then ask her to think about um the situation more deeply and I'll think about the situation more deeply and then we'll come back to it next week after we both have time to um, process and Mm -hmm. take a pause. And I, and she was really wanting to make sure that she had an authentic dialogue and that it was brought to a resolution that was Mm -hmm. um, meaningful. And even though in the end she might have to make a difficult decision that this person might not agree with, she she was hopeful that if she really, really listened and honored this person, that she could walk away with a broader perspective than the other person could too, and that they could find a common ground exactly. together. And I just um it just it was so heartwarming to see somebody to put so much time and thoughtfulness into having a, a conversation yes. in a in, through a different paradigm. Exactly. It is a different paradigm. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just a fun aside, I've been watching the um newspaper about the University of Colorado uh, women's basketball team and they had a coach who was really quite authoritarian and they were losing all these games so she lost her job they've just recently hired this new coach and her whole philosophy is one of getting to know the students having these personal home relationships and they have had this winning streak that they did not even expect because and they say it's because of the coach coming uh-huh. in with this whole new approach talk about carrying literacy and connecting uh-huh. with relationships and meaning and purpose and, and giving them a sense that they, they're worthy and they have these strengths and so I'm just kind of intrigued with that as an example out in the world mm-hmm. of this is needed to change make changes mm-hmm. in very tangible outcomes I mean, these are, these are serious outcomes that we can influence in terms of bettering our humanity. I don't know if we have questions that have emerged. We don't have any questions right now. If you can't find the chat box, just hover over the bottom of your um, computer screen if you're on computer. Um, I, I love the examples that you're both using because I think it makes it more understandable in a lot of a lot of different ways so I think other examples I mean that's a beautiful example and an example of an outcome I'm sure the other one you described Sarah will be the same 
the outcome of how somebody feels and about a, a meeting or a decision that's made is really very, very differently affected by the attitude and approach. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you have other examples that you might share or. Well, not just examples, but I think what is we're unfolding here is really about our humanity and what do people need to flourish and to grow and to be honored and to be valued and to excel in their own right relation for themselves to be the best person they could possibly be. Like what comes to mind is some of the work of um, Nail Noddings and those ingredients even for an educational program to really hold the other in the highest ethical ideal mm-hmm. for themselves, even if they can't see it for themselves at a time. I think it's such a beautiful concept to hold about. We never know another person's story. Mm-hmm. And I, I've read somewhere that if you ever truly listen to another person's story, you will never have an enemy. Mm-hmm. Because it's about understanding the connections of our humanity that we're all on this planet together, and it is like one world and one heart and one mm-hmm. one humanity that we're sharing on this planet. Mm-hmm. And this is part of our literacy of waking up mm-hmm. and of evolving in our consciousness to pay attention that what I'm doing to the other, I'm doing to myself, mm-hmm. and it, it just backfires. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's quite dramatic. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it's part of our responsibility to um, reveal this Mm -hmm. and name it. You know, that's one of the important things about, you know, John Parsardi has this expression. He said, if you can name something, you can change the world. And by naming this Caritas illiteracy and Mm -hmm. calling it up and putting a light on it, you know, bringing light into the darkness Mm -hmm. can really reveal and help to transform from the inside out because we're all waking up together then. Yeah. 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 Now here is one good question. Um, Let's see. People are really appreciating the discussion here. They're getting a lot out of it. Um, Let's see. Where did I see that? How, how might we, do you think, Let's see. Do you have suggestions about how to teach or talk about listening and how you might deconstruct it for beginners? Mm, That's a really good question. I think both Jean and I have used listening exercises um, in conferences and in the classroom where we just um, what I do is I take I ask a a question um, that depending on the level of the students in the classroom, I might ask them to share a story about the first time that they remember being cared for for some by someone else, or maybe um, a story about when um, the first time um, that they had a family member in a hos- in the hospital or cared for a patient and, te- and share that story. And the other person just has to be quiet and listen for three to five minutes. You can pick the time, but um, it's a very transformative ex- experience and then have the students switch roles mm-hmm. and to just um, be quiet and listen. You know, research has shown that the average doctor listens for like 18 seconds and the average nurse for 21 seconds. So for us to just listen for three to five minutes and um, and then ask the students what that was like to be to be both listened to and to be the listener. Right. And it's amazing how much of what comes out of the students' experiences is related to caring science and caring literacy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And again, I've done similar things with, you know, training programs with hospitals and all, and, you know, you participated, Jan, in these. And it's really quite profound. And in some instances, people end up crying mm-hmm. uh, because you never know what you need to be talking about. And when someone is holding that sacred space, and just allowing you to hear yourself, it gives space where you can begin to hear yourself. And otherwise, we're so busy and our minds are full, we don't have that quiet inner time to even hear ourselves. So it's a gift to us, and it's also a gift to the person who we're creating that, holding that space for. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing about this listening is that uh, when we hear another person's story, it also helps us to hear our story, mm-hmm. because any one story could be our story. Mm-hmm. It, it makes us share a, a humility of our common bond of humanity. Mm-hmm. Like whatever happened to this person could be me. Mm-hmm. And exactly. that's pretty sobering. You know, it's pretty humbling. It's, it makes us really yeah. appreciate 
uh, each other. Yeah. The other thing that comes out of this work and out of sharing stories and really deep listening is that we allow ourselves to be vulnerable mm-hmm. and we allow other people to be vulnerable in, in exactly. a safe way. Exactly. And um, I don't think we ever truly um, get to our own humanity or another person's humanity unless we uh, allow for that vulnerability and that deep authenticity that comes from um, from a beautiful human to human connection. So those are just key elements that um, that don't come out in a classroom if we're only lecturing exactly. or don't come out um, in our relationship with our peers if um, if we don't get to know each other. Exactly. Right. Right. Okay, here's a question about nursing education. Let's see. How let's see. How do we engage literacy with our students and cultivate this caring literacy so they can further engage it in the world of the professional? I think one of the ways is that we start having some new criteria by which we assess students. I call it um, rather than evaluation process, I kind of like the idea of authentication, mm-hmm. that we work with the student in such a way that we have authenticity of their own experiences where they can actually sh- demonstrate through their own story or through their own uh, actions and behaviors uh, the authenticity of their connection with another person. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing in, uh, is in creating in the classroom. Uh, I've always tried to create a, a community of caring in the classroom where they actually learn. And, you know, early on we were using Peggy Chan's Peace and Process, mm-hmm. uh, Peace and Power uh, as the process where we let everybody check in. And even in a large group, um, you may not have time for everybody, but you allow for some people to check in and see where they are and see what the issues are and even co-create the structure of the course, mm-hmm. I think is another part of this flexibility of moving forward in 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 the critical literacy to be in, in a right relation with the students and the faculty together mm-hmm. working for the, the shared learning. And you, and I think what you're really highlighting, Jean, is we have gotten so into knowledge and skills in nursing education that we have we have um, neglected the effect the effective domain of learning. And um, many of our caring science partners and colleagues um, who are redoing nursing curriculum, some of you are on the call right now, are really learning that what they want to do at in building a caring curriculum is to begin with effective learning, begin with those connections, begin with um, using some sort of arts and humanities, whether it's a book or a drawing or connecting to students' reasons for coming into the profession in a a deep way and connecting with their effective um, domain of learning and what is their, their commitment and their engagement to nursing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've been creating space for authentic dialogue and for, you know, questioning um, that in this kind of environment of caring science, uh, every question sacred. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you honor. There's no there's no no question that mm-hmm. can be asked. And I think then that builds in for the faculty to create some kind of criteria by which you have this authentication process. So you find new forms of evidence of reinforcing Caritas literacy, mm-hmm. both in, and this is where it's happening in the clinical, where we're developing these computerized mm-hmm. documentation mm-hmm. systems of the Caritas processes, for example, can actually be new forms of documentation. And you know, we have this in the clinical, but we haven't necessarily done it in the educational mm-hmm. arena. So right now with this um, pilot we're doing with Prescani, we've taken five of the Caritas processes mm-hmm. and, and uh, factor analyze them down to five out of the 10 and we're asking patients and maybe we need to revise this in some form for students, but we're just quickly, we're asking patients, what is your care delivered with loving kindness? Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of heretical as a question. And then uh, did you have a trusting relationship with your practitioner? Were your basic needs met with dignity? Did you experience a healing environment and were your values and beliefs met? These are other forms of literacy or caring literacy that can be documented now in in relation to outcomes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. 
And they also help students identify their own ethics and values from the profession exactly. from the beginning. And those lay the foundation to build the knowledge and the skills. And the ethics and the values aren't the afterthought, but they are the foundation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is beautiful conversation. There's one person that's asking about how you retrieve or re- maybe they mean revive caring and practicing nurses. Because sometimes they are desensitized to what we're talking about. Yeah, this is the whole focus of the work I've been doing for the last 20 years <laughs> is really working with hospitals largely in transforming practice through theory guided practice models. And of course, the magnet initiatives have helped this tremendously. And at the same time, uh, some hospitals are doing magnet just for the wrong reason, perhaps, or maybe I shouldn't judge that, but where they're doing it authentically to really transform from self and system from the inside out through authentic people bringing the human back into the healthcare system through these new models, new paradigms and innovation and, and, and really a creative exploration. That's where you, it's unlimited. It's amazing what nurses will do when they have permission and they feel like they have the authenticity of a theory to guide their practice by bringing back caring, it's unbelievable what can happen. And that's why we have all these you know, national hospitals and others working in this, in this field to mm-hmm. transform. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. And the Caritas Coach Program is Absolutely. Um, a six-month program that um, is often nurses are sponsored by their hospitals to come and learn about Caritas coaching and how to be um, a, a leader in caring in the hospital. And then they can take that back to their institutions and um, model the way for others. Many of the uh, affiliate hospitals that work with us, they now hold annual resiliency conferences and um, they have healing rooms and they create presence and space within the hospitals and institutions to honor um, caring literacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I think it highlights again the importance of language and giving voice and language to this, and you have to bring it to another level. And so, you know, this languaging of these phenomena of caring and our practice models becomes very important. And I've said this so many times, but in this postmodern world we're in, if you don't have your own language, you don't exist. And if we don't have the language and the, the fluency and the literacy of caring, and healing and health and humanity and wholeness and dignity and preserving our, our very being, then then we are really um, amiss and we are lost at sea in terms of our role in, in the world. Mm-hmm. And I think um, there's a lot of comments that just watching and listening to both of you be respectful of the other and listen authentically. You're the, the exemplars of what caring can be be and what it means in our world. So I, I know I know that's observed and noted and probably the best way to, to teach some of this, actually. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Of course, we could say the same for you, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't fishing for a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> evidence. Well, I think what we all have learned um, that have been working in this is it really begins with us. And, exactly. and we're all um, a work in progress. Mm-hmm. And I know I have a lot of learning and growing to continue to do. And and that's the beauty of it is that um, the more that we engage in our own learning and growth, um, the more we continue to stay connected to our own humanity, Mm -hmm. um, that we become that much more connected to others and others' humanity. And it it allows us to be imperfect Mm -hmm. and to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And and then it's a safe environment to do so because we connect on a human level. The other thing I love about it is like that transpersonal dimension of um, going beyond the ego. Like if you can be beyond the ego and, and be present and then respond to the other person, it's like it's this joy and delight to kind of like, oh, you get to meet this new person. <laughs> and it's, it's not about, uh, you know, it's yeah. like about us, but it's not about us. And you sort of forget yourself. And I love that yeah. kind of way of being with this uh, caring literacy. Uh, yes okay let's see if i have something else i think we have time for about one more question okay undergrad 20 years how do you bring colleagues to a place of value and caring as part of the curricula Mm. you know that's something that i've been working a lot on and i think you uh, i say over and over again you just start where you are are and you find one or two people to um, to join you. And um, what I have found is the more 
that we, it just snowballs from there. And the students, if you can get into some classrooms or visiting, I visit a lot of classrooms and the students um, are asking for more um, on caring science and caring literacy and they're wanting it in the programs. And so what we're finding is students are putting it on their course evaluations. They're, they're asking for it for the other, for the faculty to do more in caring science. And it's slowly starting to turn the interest of other faculty. And then other faculty come to and say, well, the students really like what you're doing. They want more of it. How can we be a part of it? I think the other thing is invitation, invitation, invitation. Yes. It's always an invitation. I think we sometimes want to get into this mandate kind of model or you, well, you're you supposed to do this or you have to do this. And, you know, the hidden curriculum will undo that every time. So it's always an invitation like it's there. You're saying you create this opportunity, you invite people, you give them an opportunity, you invite the students, and then the students are the ones that change. Yeah. It changes from the inside out. And it's contagious. It is. And it's not, and like, I love what you said, Gina, is it's nothing you can mandate because if you yeah. try to mandate it, then you're being inconsistent it's not, with, you can't, with caring science. You can't script it. It's the yeah. same thing. You can't script it. It has and to be, gets, that's that why gets, I get that self-work. So that gets back to the caring literacy as well. Yeah. yeah. You, exactly. have that. <laughs> you have to be it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> We teach who we are. We practice who we are. Yes. Well, I want to thank you, Jean, for coming and being with you, us today Sarah, in the center pleasure. and talking about caring literacy. And Jan, for fielding questions. It's always wonderful Absolutely. to be together. Yeah. And I wanted to share the screen with you all and let you see some of the upcoming programs that we have um, yes. in um Yay, there we go. Yeah. You can find more about some of the upcoming programs um, that will be occurring in the next six to nine months on the um, Watson Caring Science Center homepage. And that's this for you. And the book that we've been referring to today um, on the latest work in human caring literacy is, is there for you as well. So thank you all for thank joining us. Thank you so us. much. Yeah, happy holidays. happy holidays.